The Apostle Paul was walking through the streets of Ephesus one day and he came across a group of men who were disciples, disciples of John the Baptist. And so he asked these disciples, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I think Paul knew what he was asking. He understood that the baptism of John was anticipatory. It anticipated the day when the one who would follow John would baptize not only with water, but with the Holy Spirit and power. And so when Paul asked these gentlemen, have you received the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? He knew what he was asking. A great transition has occurred in history. Things have changed. We've moved beyond John. John himself pointed to the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. And so the disciples said, no, we haven't heard. We've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. We've not even heard of such a thing. And so the Apostle Paul explained to them the gospel more fully, baptizing them, laying his hands on them, and then the Spirit came down upon them in a marvelous way, so much so that they were filled with power, and began witnessing boldly, giving testimony to God's grace. They spoke in other languages. And evidence of that great transformation whereby the Spirit of God is sending His church out into all the nations of the earth. And different tongues and languages would be no barrier to the advance of the gospel of Christ. Because those who preach the gospel are empowered by the Spirit of the Lord. They speak a word revelation that transcends cultures and times, languages and peoples. It speaks to the heart. It brings life, salvation, joy. Have you received the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? When you profess faith in Christ? Do you enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life? Making you new in Christ. Making you more and more one who reflects His image before a darkened world. Do you have the Holy Spirit at work within you? It's a searching question. It's a vital question because the gift of the Holy Spirit is the great promise of the Old Covenant Scriptures. It's that for which the Old Testament prophets looked for and longed for. It was the great emblem of salvation. The Spirit of God now resting upon the church. And so the vision of Moses long ago would be fulfilled that all the Lord's people would be prophets. Why? Because the Spirit would be upon them, resting upon them. He saw the kingdom of Israel out before him as a kingdom of priests, those who were anointed of the Lord. And yet we know that in Israel only the Levitical tribe, the descendants of Aaron, would serve as priests in the kingdom. But there would come a day when the Apostle Peter would say that you are a royal nation and a holy priesthood. Describing the whole church. We who are believers in Jesus Christ are made new such that we are prophets, priests, and kings before the Lord. We have the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon us. And by the power of that Spirit, we serve in the world today. Do you have the Holy Spirit at work within you? I'm not asking a question for magnificent signs, wondrous miracles that are performed at your hands, or even magnificent works of power. But do you have the Spirit at work in your heart? Producing a love for God, joy in the Holy Spirit, joy the joy of salvation. Do you have the Spirit at work within you such that you pray, meditate on the Scriptures, and understand the things of God's Word in a way that the natural man does not? One of the great blessings that Isaiah would bring to the church of his day was the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. In this 61st chapter, after describing the great renovation of the world, 
that would come with the approach of the Messiah, in the 61st chapter, Isaiah speaks of how the Messiah, the servant of the Lord, would bring about this wonderful change in all of human history. How is it that the church would be exalted in such a way that people would come from all different nations of the earth, come into God's eternal kingdom? How would this occur? Well, it begins, Isaiah says, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon the servant of the Lord, and in the power of that Spirit, in the anointing of that Spirit, he preaches the good news to all his elect. The Spirit would be on the servant of the Lord. Now, this is not the first time that Isaiah has spoken to us of the Spirit of the Lord. He has told us in the 11th chapter that the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon the branch or the stem of Jesse. That the Spirit of the Lord, who is a spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and strength, of the fear of the Lord, this Spirit would rest on the royal son of David. And in the power of that Spirit, he would rule the earth and bring peace to the nations through justice and righteousness. And so Isaiah already had a vision of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon a servant of David, which therefore should caution us with regard to the 61st chapter. When we look at that, we see Isaiah saying, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Isaiah is not simply speaking of himself here. True. Isaiah, being a prophet of the Lord, has the Spirit of the Lord upon him. And it's in by the power of that Spirit that he preaches, that he writes. His word is the word of the Lord. But Isaiah had something far more in mind than simply his own experience of the Holy Spirit. Something far greater. Something far more powerful. What you will see here in the 61st chapter is that Isaiah makes... Use of the images of his day, the devastation that would come to Judea, the ruined cities, uh, ruined by the Babylonian armies that would march through the land. He uses these images of devastation and corruption to present to us a template or a portrait of our human devastation because of sin, our human ruin. Our human natures have been distorted and corrupted and destroyed by our sin. The image of God within us has been tainted and polluted. And Isaiah uses these earthly images to depict that great work of the Spirit of God where He will come into our lives and change things for the better. But he has in mind here the Spirit coming upon not just himself or his prophetic ministry, but the hope that he would have to the generations immediately that would follow him. But he had most especially in mind a coming one who would be of a line of David, not as Isaiah was, and who would reign from heaven above. He was anticipating the work of the messianic king, the servant of the Lord. It's fascinating when you look through Isaiah. We have had occasion to note the way Isaiah's very language reflects the Trinitarian character of God. He has these uh, repetitions in three forms, time and time and time again. You'll see it throughout this text as well. But what you have here also is one more specific intimation that there is a plurality in the Godhead. That there is Father, Son, and Spirit within the Godhead. How else can you understand these words when Isaiah says, the Spirit of the Lord? Who is this Spirit? He is clearly distinguished from the Lord, and yet he is possessed by the Lord. He comes from the Lord and comes upon the servant of the Lord. He's not a mere force. Clearly he's not an angel. He must be far greater than that because of the great power of His ministry upon the Christ, the Spirit of the Lord is God Himself. I don't know that you can see it in any other way. The Spirit of the Lord is that one who is intimate with the Lord Himself. 
who understands the Father fully and completely and reveals the Father and brings all of His power to bear upon the human situation. That is the Spirit of whom Isaiah speaks. It is the Spirit who at the time of creation hovered over the chaos of the waters of creation and by the power of God brought order into the world. Light, separation, division, life. The Spirit of the Lord hovering over the creation it is the same Spirit that would come upon the Christ. <clears throat> 